Hey everybody, welcome to Altium Academy. I am your host, Zach Peterson. I'm also a technical consultant for Altium. And today we're gonna to be talking about how to arrange the pins in your BGA into schematic symbols. Now we just recently received a question from a viewer that was looking at this aspect of setting up schematic symbols for high pin count components, specifically for BGAs. Now the question relates a little bit to FPGA development, and so we won't cover that part in this video, but I do want to address the question of how to set up your BGA symbols because they can have a lot of pins on them. And then of course, you'll have to use a multi-symbol part in order to place everything into the schematics. That's what we're gonna look at today. Let's get started. Okay, so before we get into our little tutorial and before we actually start looking at some data sheets for some components, let's take a look at this viewer question. So this question is in response to some commentary on the Your BGA and You video. It's linked in the description. Mylon999 writes, Zachariah Peterson, I'm referring to how you decide how many gates or blocks you are going to divide the overall symbol into and decide which pins go to which gates. Then, if it's not asking too much, can you show an FPBGA or FPGA used in a schematic brought into a PCB design and show how you optimize the connections and transfer that back to the schematic? Okay, so there's a lot in that question. And I say it's a lot because there's a few things going on there. First, the question is, how do you break a overall schematic symbol into its sub symbols so that you can fit a high pin count component into a single schematic. And sometimes you actually can't fit all of the sub symbols for a single component into a single schematic sheet simply because there are just way too many pins on that component. This is actually really common for larger components that are packaged as BGAs. I've shown some examples in the past with a network processor. Uh, I believe I've shown some examples in the past with like an MCU or an FPGA. I'm gonna show some examples in this video of an FPGA and an MPU. So there's a lot of different examples out there. We're gonna see a couple in this video. The other side of that question relates to FPGA development, which is how do I decide which portions of a FPGA footprint to break into a specific symbol so that I can actually optimize all of the connections that are coming into a specific interface or a specific set of logic blocks or whatever it may be in order to optimize the layout and the schematic. So that part of it, we won't look at it in this video because frankly, it'd be like a half hour long video. But what I do wanna look at is the component creation part for a large pin count BGA. How should you break up that schematic symbol into its sub symbols so that you can fit everything into your schematic sheets conveniently and that way you don't have ports running in between all your different sheets and then you create a bunch of chaos in your schematics. Okay, so within a high pin count BGA, you're in general going to have three different types of connections. The first, of course, is ground. You're gonna have ground connections somewhere. Then, of course, we have power. And then within power, we could actually have a number of different rails that we need to connect to our power. So we could have the standard, you know, 5V0, we could have 3v3. This is usually what you're gonna see on larger pin count BGAs. And then they just kind of go down from there at standard voltage levels. So 1v8, 1v2, 1v0, and then possibly 0v8. So it just depends on what the component has to do, depends what interfaces are available on the component, but in general, you may see more than one rail that you have to actually bring into this component. And then you'll have to have external power regulators for each of these rails to ensure that you can provide stable voltage at each of the different pin sets to where you need to connect. Then, in addition to power and ground, you're then gonna have a whole bunch of signal connections. Again, depending on what the component has to do and what supporting components are needed to make the system work, you could have some general GPIOs. You could have some specific interfaces like SPI, I2C or I squared C, or maybe if it's like an audio chip or it has an audio interface, you'll have like I squared S. Then you could also have a number of high speed uh, protocols or interfaces. So you could have like DDR, two, three, four, whatever the case may be. Let's say it's a network processor. It's gonna have ethernet. If it's like a, an MPU that's gonna go into a single board computer or something like this, it'll definitely have these two as well as the GPIOs and SPI and I2C. So there's gonna be 
additional interfaces that are all gonna be grouped together somewhere on that footprint so that you can access all of these different pins. Now, just to see what this looks like in an actual component, let's take a look at a couple of data sheets and let's look at uh, some symbols in Altium Designer so we can see how other people do this and then we can kind of get an idea of how we should create a set of sub symbols for a large pin count VGA. Okay, so I'm looking at Octopart right now and I have a couple different components brought up that are pretty good examples of what we want to look at when we have a very large pin count BGA. So this first one is from NXP. I've got it pulled up here on Octopart and you can see here that it's got some of the characteristics that we've been talking about here. So you can see it has multiple rails that we have to supply. Here you can see we have 1023 pin uh, FC BGA. So it's a pretty large component. The other one here is an FC FPGA has a pretty high logic gate count, and here it just lists one rail. There might be more than one. I haven't looked at the data sheet too deeply, but then also it's a 676 pin FPGA, or FPGA, excuse me. So let's go ahead and take a look at the data sheet for this component real quick, and we can kind of see what we're talking about here. So here I've pulled up the ball out for this uh, 676 pin FPGA. And um, if you actually scroll up from this particular part of the data sheet, you'll see that they actually include other versions of this component that have smaller ball count. So this is a, a data sheet for a family of components. As you scroll down from this footprint, and uh, you start to look at some of the pin names, you can start to see what I mean, how they get grouped together like this. So you can see here in row A, starting from column three, all the way down to column 24. So it's this entire set of entries into the data sheet. Um, all of this is listed as IO. What that means is on the uh, footprint, this whole row of stuff, except the first couple pins and the last couple pins, all of these pins are gonna be IOs. So if you were gonna make a schematic symbol out of this, it might be a good idea to group all of these together, especially if you were gonna use all of these pins as uh, part of the same interface. Now, the reason you would do that is because when you're actually in the schematic, it's gonna make it a lot easier to connect all of these connections in the same region of the schematic. Similarly, you'll notice here that all of these different ground pins are actually grouped together like this. So all of these different grounds, even though they might be separated here on the ball out and they're gonna be separated in the PCB layout, you could actually group all of those grounds into the same sub symbol. So you could have one symbol that's just for ground. Then as we kind of continue to scroll through here, you can see that there are these other big blocks of IOs. So this relates back to the FPGA part of the question that I showed earlier, which is how do we actually like pick all of these uh, groups of IOs and group them together so that we have our interfaces clustered in a portion of the schematic that's really easy to work with. So that is a little bit arbitrary and it relates back to what the developer has to do to make everything work. Now here, if we look at some of these other groups of pins, you can see here we have, you know, VDD, VDDP. Um, it might be a good idea to then also group all of these together into one sub symbol. So H7 through H18 and so on and so forth. So you kind of get the idea and I'll show why that is once we get back on the whiteboard. That's one strategy for this sheet. Now what I want to do is take this part number and I'm going to go into Altium Designer. I've got a blank sheet open. And then you can see here that I've got the part pulled up here in the manufacturer part search panel. So all I did was I just took the part number, copied from Octopart, hit enter, and you can see here it pulls right up. And then I can hit right click, hit place, and then it's gonna start pulling in everything. So you can already see that they've broken this out into groups of IOs when they created the schematic. And I mean, we're already at four or five subparts, and this is just gonna keep going because again, this is a massive FPGA. It's not massive, but it's, it's pretty big. You know, it's 676 pins. So this is just gonna keep going. But what they've done is they've just grouped all of these different groups of IOs onto the same symbol. And so what you could do in the schematics is you could actually have just one schematic sheet for each of these symbols, and then you could have these symbols going to specific components depending on the interface that you're going to instantiate in this FPGA. So that's one strategy for doing this. Let's take a look at this other component. So this other component is an MPU. So this is a bit different from an FPGA because in an FPGA, you're instantiating different interfaces in the logic that you get to develop and program into that component. For an MPU, it doesn't work like that. Whatever they put into the component, those are the interfaces that you get. 
And so if I go over here to the pinout listing in this data sheet and I start to scroll through this, um, you can start to see some different options that they have for uh, the interfaces that you can access. So let's go ahead and take a look here and scroll through this and see what we have. So we have PCIe, and those are all grouped onto different pins on this package. We have a PLL reference clock. You can see some inputs here. Um, we have a test point for the PLL. Here we have an ethernet interface. So this is SGMII. Um, this is an ethernet interface. Here we have a hard reset input and so on and so forth. So you can kind of see how they start to group different pins together to fit these different interfaces or functions that they've uh, built into this component. And so a good strategy for this would be to then take some of the uh, work that they've already done here and group some of these pins into uh, different sub symbols in this component. Because remember, this is a 1023 pin BGA. This is going to require sub symbols, whether you like it or not. You're going to have to make a multi symbol part to get this uh, component into Altium Designer or into any other uh, PCB design program. And so, what you could do, for example, for this is let's say I needed to make the schematic symbol for this. What I could do is maybe group clock. JTAG and DFT all into the same sub symbol. And then I would have one symbol that allows me to access all three of these interfaces. And just as you scroll down, you start to see some other examples of stuff that you can group together. So here we have all of these pins going to ground. So I could start making a sub symbol that is just going to deal with this half of the ground pins. And then I could have another symbol that deals with just this half of the ground pins. So you can start to see what you can do with this just by looking through the data sheet and identifying which groups of pins you can start to cluster together. Okay, so let's suppose that you use some of these strategies that I just talked about, and then you started to group some of those pins onto the same symbol. What's that actually gonna look like in your design software? So let's just take the MPU for example. Let's suppose that we start making some sub symbols that then correspond just to some of the power rails and then just to ground. What we can actually do is we can have one symbol here, we'll call it U1, we'll make this A, and you're gonna have a whole bunch of pins here on each side, and this can just be the symbol for ground. And so what you're gonna do is you're gonna define all of these connections being bridged back to ground. Same thing over here. So you can make one symbol that contains all of those pins that are just going to be connected to ground. So that's a really simple way to just blaze through a bunch of those connections. Let's say we make another sub symbol that is just going to be for the 2v5 rail. Well, usually in these components, we would have our second symbol that would then have its set of pins. Let's just put them all on the right to save some space. And if these are all gonna be for the 2v5 rail, then we're gonna draw a rail symbol up here It'll be 2v5 net, and then it's gonna bridge all of these. So what you're gonna find in some of these components is that there are actually gonna be ways that you can really conveniently group all of this together, and then you can make one big connection to all of those pins, and it really saves you a lot of time. You don't have to like literally draw out the 2v5 net to each one of these pins. It also doesn't make sense to separate some of these pins over into a different symbol. It's easy to then overlook which connections you need to make, and it really is better to then group all of these interfaces together onto the same symbol. Another example might be here, I mentioned like with IOs, maybe you can separate those out and break those into different interfaces or into different groups. So maybe we have like the JTAG portion here, maybe this is like an I2C bus, and then maybe this is like, you know, a set of GPIOs. So we could have, you know, this group of pins here, we could have this group of pins here, we could have this group of pins here and so on and so forth. And then maybe we have some other, some other pins over here for some other auxiliary stuff. At some point, you're gonna have to make some decisions as far as how to group these different sets of IOs and interfaces together into your sub symbols so that you can uh, ensure that you get everything into your schematics. And you wanna make sure that you just group things together in an intelligent way, think about it, plan ahead a little bit, and of course, it doesn't make sense again to separate like two of these pins on the I2C bus over here onto the ground symbol or over here onto the 2v5 symbol. So hopefully that gives you some guidance as far as how to create these multi-part symbols. And there's actually an article that I'm gonna link to in the description. That article shows you a way to very quickly create some of these high pin count symbols and footprints 
using the tools in Altium Designer. All right, that's all I got for today, folks. We're gonna come back to the second part of this question in a later video. For now, make sure you hit that subscribe button, hit the like button, leave your comments and questions in the comment section. Of course, send us your Q&A stuff to YouTube at Altium.com. We love getting your Q&A questions. And finally, don't forget to call your fabricator, folks. Yeah.